And welcome to the Business Spotlight. I'm Pat Dewar. Today I have a great show that we're going to be talking about something that will, well, it'll affect every one of us. And the reason is, is that how many of us look forward to retirement and we think, oh yeah, I'll be ready for that. Well, probably less than any of us would like to admit. Because the reality is, is that most of us are not savers. But my guest today works with clients just like you and I, in fact, she does work with me, as a, I want to say wealth coach, but I have to say so much more. She really is giving us options for the future. Cassandra, thank you so much for being on the show again. Glad to be here. Now, I know we've had you on the show before, Stanford grad, undergraduate, graduate degree. Mm -hmm. um, you work with people to help them create a, um, a financial epiphany, and that is the name of your company is Epiphany Financial, though, yes. right? Yes, yes. So when we talk about, and we've talked many times about the attitudes towards wealth, there really is a disposition, isn't there, yes. to create the kind of financial, you call them options, that mm -hmm. people really want in the future. Can you talk about that a little bit? Well, the, there is an expression that I say all the time because it is the number one truth, which is that money is not math. Money is human behavior. So as I work with people and have over the years across the nation and across all, really kind of across all economic lines, I'm, I find that it is about, and it's not a think and grow rich kind of concept, that, that's too simple. Right. But there is a psychological disposition that then, once it's coupled with right behaviors, and again, you have to know what those are, mm -hmm. and that's part of the process. So it's both mindset and it's behavioral action, and both sort of married together lead to far greater outcomes than people had in mind for themselves. Is that something that's genetic or is it learned? Uh, I would have to say it's learned. I'd have to say it's learned. You know, I'll, and I'll, I'll give an example because I give this analogy all the time to people. It's about, and again, no offense to folks that are struggling with their weight, but across I the, resemble that <laughs> remark, so it's okay. Um, and it's, <laughs> these are just factoids. These are not judgments, these are facts. The facts are that anywhere from 60 to 70% of the US population is obese. Oh yeah. And, and people don't even need to know the statistic. You can just kind of look around your neighborhood, look in your family, and you can see the reality. Look at right. the elementary schools. Okay? Yeah. It's, a, it's a tragic reality. And, and I'm not gonna get into the history of it all and, and what came about. When you think about what it really takes to stay relatively healthy and thin, relatively, you know, svelte, it's, it's outtake or output and intake. So it's right. what you consume and what you expend, energy in, energy out. The rules aren't that much different. So this whole idea that I have a thyroid problem or that I'm genetically predisposed to being heavy, no, you're not. Because when you look, again, if you look at the history facts about the weight of the United States population, it really didn't get out of control until about the 60s or 70s. And again, we can start talking about what happened with um, food production, et cetera. I'm not going to get into that right now. But you know, that the funny thing is, is money, that's about when we started losing control in our money. Yes. <laughs> it <is about> this. <laughs> yes, it is. There becomes a gluttonous kind of behavior. Um, gluttony is for, you know, one of the seven deadly sins, for what it's worth. But gluttony is not just about your food. It's about a behavior that says, I want more, 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 and I can't get enough. There is not enough to satiate something inside of me that I'm looking for. Right. Um, so again, it becomes an issue. I use that analogy because genetics, no. Some of us, sure, will carry a few extra pounds. My family disposition, we tend to stay thin and people wonder how can we eat so much and we stay thin because look at what we're eating and look at our energy level. And there's actually more that goes into it besides what you see me sitting down and eating, right? right? But some of that uh, I would think would be, it would be your parents may have eaten correctly in some of those areas. Well, if that, is that just as much of a thing in money? Yes. You know, is it, is it parent? Is, can we blame it on the parents again? Or should we, or do we have the option to choose differently now? I'm a parent <laughs> and I do believe that parents are hugely responsible for the outcome of their children. Okay. But there is a point in time. So yes, family of origin issues are real. Sure. Yes, some parents are really bad parents. Period. Or really good. A exactly. Um, and a lot of parents just don't know. Right. It's not that they're bad, not in a judgment perspective. They're just kind of ignorant. They don't know. Right. 
in the area of money, it's been my experience that most people are just ignorant. Right. They're not bad people. They're loving. They're kind. They're trying, and they're trying to do the best they can for their kids, but they just don't know. I, I had a 72-year-old gentleman and a 75-year-old spouse sitting in my office last week, closing a deal with me, starting the process with me, and he made it real clear, Cassandra. I just didn't know these things. Nobody teaches these things. Right. School's not going to teach it. Your parents didn't teach it. And he's in particular interested in the processes and the products and the tools and the resources that we are going to build together for him because he recognizes he has a good, solid 20 productive years plus in front of him. Mm -hmm. And he wants his children and grandchildren to have something a little different. So it sounds like thinking a little longer is part of this disposition. Mm -hmm. And then right information is a second part. Is that consistent with what you teach? Yes, yes. And that's actually one of the hard things for people to grasp. Again, the analogy, you don't lose 100 pounds in a month, right. maybe even in a year. It's slow, steady, movement by movement, and it might be years before the true results actually where you begin to realize them, experience them, enjoy them. And that is a hard, delayed gratification is very hard in this microwave society. Right. We really right. do want everything yesterday. So with money, what are some of the principles that you teach right from the get go? So one of the very first things, and this is the way I sort of vet my clients, because I don't People ask me all the time what type, the, big, the first question people ask when you're in the world of financial services is what type of client. And they're sure. asking what's their economic threshold. Right. And I don't answer it via, it's not about how much money you make. It's about your mental disposition, which is a little harder for people to get at. I have clients that, and, and the range, literally, I have clients that commit to $100 a month. I have clients that commit to a million dollars a year. Right. And obviously, the client who commits to 100 a month is making a little less than my client who's committing to a million a year. Interestingly enough, though, when you study the percentage of save, right. the client that's committing to a million a year, that's 50 plus percent of that person's intake. Oh, wow. The client that's committing to the $100, it's, about, it's less than 5% of their intake. And, and again, people argue that, well, it's harder to save, it's harder to do this when you make less money. And it's, it's, that's not what's hard. What's hard is to tell your mind, I can't, if I make $50,000 a year, if I, get, if I take home $3,000 a month, $4,000 a month, I cannot live like someone who's taking home 10. Right. I can't. Right. My lifestyle will look different, is going to look different, should look different. And it's neither, and that, so that's one of the principles I gotta get people to understand is, first of all, you stop comparing yourself to everybody else. Right. Your success, your goals are not gonna look like, I mean, my average family, my average client really does as a household is bringing in around $10,000 a month. It's just, when I start looking at the numbers. But that's not that, that, that I wanna say that's not that hard, though it's not the norm. The, the, the fact is, is that for the business professional, uh, two teachers, yes. uh, a, a sales guy and a teacher, a sales guy and you know a, a mid-level manager and you know a, almost a stay-at-home mom exactly. that has part-time work exactly. is gonna gross close to 100. Yes. Is that about right? That is true. Now I know that the, the, the national average and where money is and the, there's like 4% that own like 90% of all things. Sure. But for the rest of us and what we see, yes. that's not that far from reality. No, it, indeed. And so it's, I say that because it's um, the, the statements of the, the principles. And one is, I guess what I'm trying to get across there is recognize where you are. Right. And, and to some extent, um, be honest about whether you, do you really want what it takes to get to that 10,000, 20,000 a month? Because there is a trade-off. Right. A significant trade-off. There's a reality to people who work at that kind of level. You know, and it, I, you know we, we watch on TV the people who are experiencing, you know, the lifestyles of rich and famous, I guess that's an old show now, but Kardashians and all these reality shows of people who are, you know, very wealthy, ridiculously right. wealthy, and they seem to like spend their whole day gossiping about people and getting manicures and pedicures. That's not what people who make those levels of dollars are doing every day. Right. <laughs> They're sustaining economic empires really to sustain that level of income. Right. And, and so when you're making 50,000 a year, you're not even, stop even looking at those people. Just stop. Right. Stop thinking you're them. You're not them. 
And, and that's hard for people. I, I, don't, I don't know why that's so difficult, but that's one of the well, first things. Well, part of it, I think, is where we've trained. We've, we've been trained by TV. And so when we've been trained by TV, we think that's the standard. And the reality is, is that that's the exception. Yes, you know, very much For so. people to be on TV is an exception. Yes. So kind of with that, once we get past that, going back to that equation, money is not math. Money is... Human behavior. What does that mean, really? Because that's a core, yeah. that's what, what I call one of your nine pound pearls. Yes. So when, it's one of the, again, besides some of the first questions when I, people reckon, or here I'm in financial services, you know, what size a client? And they're trying to get a sense of the, the economic Do they threshold. fit or not? The second question they ask oftentimes is, well, what kind of like what's your stock tip? What's right. your greatest tip? What do you, what's that investment strategy that's going to be the be all end all? And that's another part I have to tell them is there's no there's no one product solution. There's not one um, investment solution. One thing's not going to save you and make you the mega millionaire. Well, it's like the there's no uh, get thin pill that does exactly. the overnight. Exactly. There is no one club that gets you for golfers that, you know, we've talked about yeah. uh, about that before. So so the whole money's not math. It's rec there's not one thing. If money were math, and this is the second part of what I said, if money were math, we'd all be mega millionaires. Would right. we not? Because there'd be an equation. We'd plug in the numbers, and, the, and we'd do the multiplications, and we'd factor all the variables, and it'd equal out to sort of millions of numbers. And we'd be able to backtrack. We'd be able to pick a number, and then move back, and then behave appropriately. But think about that. Even if there were a number out there, because there was a commercial for a while going around with people with a number floating around their head, or they carried a number, First of all, how do you know what your number is? Right. That's another thing I think people, my number is bigger than I can imagine. Because I don't know what the next 20, 30, 40, 50 years is gonna look like, and I do have that time in front of me. Right. I don't know what the number is. I wanna get the maximum potential with what I'm capable of, and all I'm capable of is today. So That's I wanna an important point though, isn't it? Yes. All you've got is today. Yes. So stop looking at tomorrow and say, okay, what can I do today that will help tomorrow. That's it. So it's, it's both a, it's that constant yin and yang. It's the chicken or the egg. You know, it's, I have to plan for tomorrow, but all I have is the control of today. Right. So I, I don't know the outcome. There's a proverb. It's Proverbs 21, 31. And it says the horse is made ready for battle, but the victory is up to the Lord. Okay. Meaning I don't have the outcome. I, I don't control that. I do control today. And so more, you do what you can today. And more likely than not, there are behaviors today that will set you up for success tomorrow. Again, if you, if you, one of the, one of the factoids, so the money math part, one of the factoids, 20% savings. 20%. 20%. Now, some people just change channels. Yes. <laughs> Is there a system to curry getting to the 20%? Yeah. And, and it's, interestingly enough, it's not like there's a system so much as there is a behavior. There's a commitment. People start where they start. Again, I mentioned the client that a lot of my clients barely are saving 5%. Right. But they're committed, but we talk about what does 20% look like within your dynamic, and are you, are you willing to get there and to do the behaviors and the processes that will get you there? And, and, they, and they do, otherwise they don't tend to work with me. <laughs> <laughs> because they don't, they can work with me, but they're not gonna get, they're not reaching their maximum potential. Well, one of the stories that you told me recently was about a guy that came in and he didn't have a lot, but he was willing to do what it took. Yes. What did that sound like? Well, it was actually one of my more exciting, first time I'd met the gentleman, he was a referral, and again, he is not bringing in a whole lot of money. He's a, right. he's a, he's a single dad, working hard to better himself, and he, but he, he, he knows he knew some of the principles just because he is educating himself. Right. And I had to ask them. A lot of things he was saying were blowing my mind that this young gentleman is 35 years old, not young, he's young, not, not a kid. I'm he's like, a boy he's next a, to me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> For a lot of us, he's got, he's got a good 60 plus years in front of him, so I don't know. Um, I, I, I asked him, I said, you were articulating principles and concepts that I haven't heard a lot of people articulate. Where right. are you getting this from? Because I've been doing a lot of reading. So he's been spending a lot of time doing his own reading. That's kind of, you know, the orchestration of the per perfect events. He comes to me. So we sit down and talk, and he'd already prepared his whole budget. He'd written out his goals, short term, long term, his dreams and his hopes. I'm like, I, people don't come to me. This is our first meeting, you know, and I'm like, wow. And I told him, 
bring as much as you want. So he did everything I had said. So before. he's a bit of a planner. He at least is, I mean, I said, this is what you could do. If you do this stuff, come to me, we can have a more fruitful conversation. So the fact that he even did that is an indication, nothing to do with me, it's right. everything to do with him. We sat down and talked, and he's barely saving, you know, his 5%, but he is saving something. And then, because, and let me, let me make this point real quick. You will not have wealth unless you save for wealth. Right. It's not like it's magic. The way that you are able to do anything exciting with your money is you have to save it first. So that's why I focus on savings first. I have heard somebody describe that whatever it is you want to call this nest egg as a magnet. That the funny thing is, is that the more that you add to it, the more attractor factor it tends to have because it gives, goes back to that, it gives you options. It does. And it's, it's again, so much of the reason you were able to get there was because you had, you had dispositions, mental, disposi position, mental dispositions and behaviors that allowed it to be there. Yeah, yeah. So it's, a, it's an exponential growth kind of variable. This gentleman, long story short, brings me all of his stuff. We looked at his numbers and come to find out, you know, as obviously at least he was saving about five. And I told him, let's talk about what it would look like in your budget for you to get to 20%. And if, when I said that, he, you know, it was kind of like, Ugh. I mean, he literally stepped back like, oh my God. And I said, I didn't say right now. I said, what would it look like over the course of a year or two to get there? How would that feel? And because and, I gave him permission, I said, look, it's like a fad diet. I don't want you to be on a fad diet. If I don't give you permission to have a brownie sundae at least once a week, you're never going to lose the weight. Right. But now, you cannot have a brownie sundae every night. So that's the point. You give yourself permission. And so I give my clients permission to do with, you know, and I tell them, blow the money. Blow it. Have at it. Because otherwise, you'll blow up your whole system right. if you don't give yourself some breathing room, you know? On any case, we, we spent this time kind of talking through. And, and it's funny because, you know, I'm giving them all this permission to kind of not rush into the 20. But then after the conversation, and, you know, a couple of minutes in, he's like, you know, I could do this. I could do this now. I mean, and he starts talking about all the different things like, well, this is going to come off and then I'm going to do this. And, and he starts like build. And I, I, I honestly was like, just slow down. Like, don't, I don't want, I almost didn't want him to do that. Cause I'm like, cause I, I mean, maybe he can, maybe he'll be one of those people that really can kind of cold turkey it. I was a cold turkey. I am a cold turkey person. Most people aren't cold turkey people. He, he actually might be. My point is, um, it was a process of him coming to the realization that he has to have certain behaviors around it before I can even begin to start talking about building more wealth. But you know, one of the cool things is that you gave him permission to think in terms of that large of a number. For a lot of time, a lot of people, they just never think in those terms. They, they think smaller numbers, smaller numbers, because they don't have the larger numbers to work with. And so they disqualify themselves. Sure. So when you look at some of the, the things that that I'm hearing, I'm hearing longer term planning, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but it sounds like you're looking at 20 plus years, is that correct? Definitely, definitely. You know, again, think about a parent who, and again, I put it in the context of parents because a lot of my folks are parents. It is 20 years for them because their children are being born. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's 18 years, right? A lot of times the, where people come to me, and I had a 31 year old gentleman, his wife is pregnant, come to me and uh, two exact same similar demographics. And both are suddenly realizing, oh my gosh, I gotta get my kid to college. So for the first time, they're really being forced into that 20 year dynamic. And so it's a conversation of, is there a better way to pay for my kid's college? And yes, there is, rather than just giving all your money away. Right. You know, still being able, because we want to be able to give our kids an education, you don't have to. Right. It's not, it's not a need, it's a want. And that's, that is another principle I have to teach people. There's a difference between what you need and what you want. Most of us undermine ourselves and undermine our ability to have wealth because we live totally in the want and we have no idea that 90% of, 99% of that is pure want and not right. need, but we mix up the two. And so we, we're always saying, but I need that. I need that. I got to do that. I got to have that. No, you don't. No, you don't. You will survive without it. Um, but it's, that's, again, the human behavior side of it. I've got to get people to recognize and start using language that is appropriate so we, you, the proverbial you, can help yourself. It's not me telling you what to do with the money in terms of like what you label stuff, but you got to label them correctly. But you know, one of the things, even like the, the whole college concept, um, if I'm not mistaken, correct me, but a, a part of the process is to reframe what you're doing with 
college or retirement or long-term planning in that the you create somewhat of a bank yes. for people for your family yes so that the child doesn't get a gift they get a loan it, potentially yes. yeah somebody does and that's to, to a good point I spent a lot of time in the world of semantics I'm reframing words right to the proper what they really are say we we look at financial contracts we look at these products insurance securities you know, all the, the products are available to your average bear client. Right. And again, unless you're sporting 10 million or more kind of on an annual basis, you're, you're not going to get access to some, to some things. And let's just be real clear. Sure. <laughs> so hardworking moms and dads of America. When you think about a college education fund, and this is what got me motivated. Here I am putting a bunch of money, not enjoying it in the moment. My son's not enjoying it. I'm not enjoying it. We're not even using it for what I perceive as my needs. So I can put it in a box that I'm then going to transfer to university because I want to be able to give him sort of that leg up, right? right? Um, that is a, one of my goals as a parent. Well, in my, because I went to Stanford, I had a full ride, undergrad and master's. Thank you, Lord, for that full ride. I don't know if my son's going to be as, you know, lucky, blessed. And yes, of course, he's going to Stanford, at least a top five university, right? And that's going to be a $200,000 education. I mean, it is. It's just the Ouch. nature of the beast. So I wanted to have 100,000. My goal is to have 100,000 to give to my son so at least he has half of his education paid for. And you know, of course, I'm gonna encourage him for scholarships, et cetera, but let's just be, you know, let's just plan. $100,000, calculate the time value of money on $100,000 that I will never have in my future. Think about that. It's not that I'm just giving my son $100,000. I am taking away from me having millions of dollars in the future because I will never see the growth of that money again. And, and honestly, I don't feel that great about giving away that much money to my kid even though I gave him a leg up. It doesn't, it doesn't resonate with me. It doesn't make me feel warm, warm and, and fuzzy. fuzzy. <laughs> but part of that is because you understand the money equation that you're talking about. I mean, for a lot of people, they, they don't think through that if I take away ten thousand dollars or a hundred thousand mm -hmm. dollars towards a specific adventure like college yes that then all of a sudden that eliminates what that could have created yes later yes within your own system so think about it even if I chose to do that because I've, I've done stuff like that right I've taken big chunks of money and paid cash paid for the car paid for the wedding paid for the car you know whatever I paid for you give away that chunk of money I had to I, I have a hole in my economy Right. Whether it's a $10,000 hole, a $100,000 hole, I just created a hole. I just saved all those years and I gave it away. I gotta save again. Right. So now I'm in debt to myself. I'm in, I, I have to loan myself back the money, right? And that's really where some of these concepts come in. And again, it's the private reserve strategies, privatized banking. Uh, it is about creating a series of banks for lack of a better word, my compliance doesn't like me saying those words, but it operates in the same fashion. If I create repositories of cash that I'm going to create for any different purpose, whether it's my annual taxes, whether my son's education fund, or some future retirement, I'm creating buckets of money. If I can create that money in such a way that even when I utilize them, and, and then have to replenish because there's a hole, I'm never losing the growth from the very beginning, even when I have collateralized against it. And this gets into other conversations that we've had, um, and there are other videos out there to watch. And it's, it's some of the foundational concepts and processes that I work with clients to incorporate into their personal economy. And you're trying to encourage them to really learn it, process it, and internalize it. And, and it, I see where that process that you're talking about really is money's not math. So, so what's that statement again? Money is? Money is not math. Money is human behavior. So your human behavior is to create these banks, you call yeah, them, or buckets reserve, of money, yeah. buckets of money, <laughs> whatever you want to call yeah. it. But there are some benefits long term because of the way that the laws are written. Yes. Uh, that it's why the, in the uber wealthy really tend to run in this direction, don't they? Yes. And now I, I didn't, I forgot to mention, you know, you're like 
number three in the country in your business? Yeah, actually, so I, I recently got married and took about two, three months off planning this wedding and preparing for it. So I didn't work for a little while, so I've dropped number four, by the way. Oh. I was number two, I'm number four at this particular moment. <laughs> it's kind of a joke. Um, <laughs> yes, I mean. Well, it looks like you've got some recovery to yeah, do. Yeah, I know, I need to catch up, right? <laughs> no, I'm, I'm doing well. Anything else that you'd want people to know about one, how to get to hold of you and what your process is in bringing on new clients? Sure. Yeah, no, the, the, my company is Epiphany Financial, and just to be confusing, the website is uh, financialepiphany.com, and there are videos on there. There's one that says, why is Cassandra different? That's helpful for people. When I sit down with folks, and I'm thrilled that this comes out of their mouth within the first meeting, they're like, wow, I've never actually heard anybody speak about money the way you do. No one's ever talked to me like this before. These are new concepts. That's both a good thing and a bad thing. The bad side of it is, why doesn't anybody talk about this? Well, there are tens of thousands of us around the country talking about this. I'm not that unique, okay? But oftentimes, I do have to work. In fact, I have to work harder for the $100 a month client than I did for the million dollar a year client. Oh, yeah. I mean, always. Because one of them does have some practices because they got the wealth. Yes. The other one has to learn how to start. Yes. And that, and, and, um, and so this is, you know, so sometimes, yeah, when I'm working my tail off for that person, you know, and, and again, it's not me. I showed you how to do everything. We talked it through. You made commitments, not to me, to yourself. You know, we mapped out this plan. You were excited. But then inevitably, I'm checking back in in three months and six months and nine months and a year. And we're having conversations. And you're not doing any of the behaviors that we talked about. You know, I mean, and then, of course, a year later, you're looking at me wondering, you know, why you're not this mega millionaire yet. And I'm thinking, you're... I can't, I can't fix you to, you know, there's only so much I can do. And the beautiful part is most of my clients, it's usually about that year into it or two years for some, the ones that weren't behaving. How about that? That go, okay, 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 I'm ready, I'm ready, you know? And it's sometimes it just takes what it takes. So that's part of the answer a little bit. When people work with me, I tell people, go to the website, check out the video, why is Cassandra different? It helps frame some of the conversation. And then we're going to sit down and talk. And I have clients all over the country, so sometimes we talk via, you know, the computer and the, you know, and, and the phone. Um, or let's go have coffee. And we're going to chat and we're going to talk about, again, your dispositions. And they should be, they can call you. I know the number's oh, yeah, on yeah. the screen. They can call. You know, my cell phone. Just go ahead and give you a call. Absolutely. I know that as we're, we're wrapping this up, folks, you know, Cassandra Vitaka has been on the, on the business spotlight a number of times. Why? Because she's worth it. Uh, honestly, she's a, she is my wealth coach. I'd, I'd send her to you anytime you can get a hold of her. Call her. Make sure that you plug into what she's trying to teach you, how to become the, well, the one with options mm -hmm. in the future, the one that has a little bit of revenue that can help sustain you as you go into your, your older years. This is Pat Dewar. The Business Spotlight is really helping the business owners tell their story online, on air, and all over the world. We'll see you next time.